All right, Santa girl. Won't you forget about all your troubles in your life? We received the power. right now, it ain't about you. We give you all of the glory right now. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you. Why, y'all? For you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, yeah. Together, together, together. That's why we worship you. We worship you. Oh, I need some believers up in here, sir. Come on. We worship the you yeah. in this house. I, I need a witness. In the sanctuary, a living we receive give you all the give glory. You all the glory. We give you all of the glory yeah. right now. Do I have any true believers up in here? We honor you. Just wave it. You're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Oh, that's why we worship yeah. you. Yeah. You, you don't have to be old to praise him. Come on, young folk. I got some young folks up in here. I, I know that the hour will come. We have put together some suggestions for you that we believe will help you to get the most out of your worship experience. Listen to these 10 suggestions and attempt to implement them in your home as you transform your home into your sanctuary. Be on time. Worship service starts at 10.15. Sing along with the song leader. Stand when taking communion. Bow your head during prayers and pray along with the prayer leader. Take off your PJs. Dress reverently. Clothes affect how we feel and how we behave. Have your Bible open during the sermon. Put everything aside and focus on the worship. Worship along with family members and not all on separate devices. Pay attention to your environment and reduce any distractions. Prepare for service by preparing your mind with prayer, meditation, or religious music. Father, we, your children, we come this morning, dear Lord, giving you thanks. We thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy and the many blessings you've given us in our lives. Father, we live in an, a world that, for those that don't know you, can be uncertain. But Father, we, your children, that know your truths, we know your will. Father, we know the absolute truth that comes to us through your word as you speak to us, as you teach us, as you guide us, and you let us understand, dear Lord, your perspective and the things that you want in, in our lives. Father, we live in a world that can cause people to lose hope. But Father, we have the one hope, the hope of Father realizing that our destiny is certain, and that's to be with you for eternity. We ask that you bless Paraland West. We ask that you bless each and every family. Bless the fathers and mothers. Bless the children. Bless the single households, dear Lord. And Father, as we live our lives, we ask that your Holy Spirit will always guide us. And Father, allow our hearts and minds to be focused on you, to be focused on things that are true, on things that are honest, on things that are just, on things that are pure, on lovely things. Things that are of good report, dear Lord. And we just ask that you always allow us to just stay focused on you, to not allow the evil ones to take our focus off of you. Father, be with our minister this morning as he has studied your word and is sharing it with the rest of us in this assembly. And we thank you for this digital assembly, Father, to allow us to obey you this first day of the week. 
We love you, Father, and we thank you as we pray these things through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, over and over. Well, you know that he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. What a love, Lord, between my God and I. I'm falling over and 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 over. And he keeps cleansing me. Over and over, yes, over and over. Blessing Lord keeps on cleansing me. Over and over, over and over. Oh, you know that He gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And what a love, oh, between my God and I. Feel His holy power. 
you died for me. I'm so glad you shed your blood for me. I'm so glad you set me free. Now come to a part of our worship service, the communion, where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We find scriptural example in Acts chapter 20 and verse number seven, where it reads, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 23 says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse number 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread together. Most holy and honorable Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son to die for our sins. Forgive us of all of our sins by word, thought, or deed so that we may take this bread that represents your son's broken body on the cross with a clean hands and a pure heart. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may now take the bread. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 25 says, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the cup together. 
Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness to die for the for our sins and him taking our place on the cross of Calvary. We take this cup that represents your son's shed blood, for without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take the cup. We want to instruct you on how you can give your tithes and offering online. You simply go to the official Pearland West Church of Christ homepage at pearlandwestcoc.org. And in the upper left at the top of the page, you will see online giving. You simply click that link and it takes you to our online giving page. Under choose a fund, click general giving, the amount you would like to contribute, and the option to include a memo and the frequency of how you would like your contribution to be. You then click no thanks and click on the con contribute button. This takes you to the PayPal page where you enter an email or a mobile number. You also have the option to contribute via debit or credit card, after which you click next and your contribution is entered. You will also notice a QR code in the middle of the screen or in the right corner of the screen right now. And you can use the camera of your smartphone to capture that QR code and it will take you directly to the online giving page and you can follow the exact same instructions that I just gave. Thank you, church family, and God bless. We now come to a part of our service, which is contribution. We find recorded in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 6, and it reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Let us pray for the contribution. Kind Master, we come to you giving you all thanks, honor, glory, and praise. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to give back that of which you have given us a small portion Father, we pray for the Pearland West uh, congregation that we use it in a timely and fashionable way for the upbuilding of your kingdom. This is our prayer in your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. As I travel through this field, and there is a friend who walks with me. He leads me Oh, please. 
sing praises to your name. Oh Lord, praises to your name. Oh Lord, for your name is great.
to our worship experience at the Fairland West Church of Christ. We are only six weeks away from our re-entry into the building. We're asking everyone to remember to put that target date on your calendar. January the 16th, we plan to come back and be together in fellowship as a family. We look forward to you being a part of that first service, January 16th. We've been looking at the theme of sharpening our vision in preparation of coming back as a family. We want to do our work. We want to do our part. But we can't do that if we don't have a clear understanding of who we are and what exactly it is that God expects us to do. As the city of God that's embedded within a city, what is our disposition to be as the city of God. Well, we've talked about the idea of community. We're going to continue looking at that and what exactly it means to build a sense of community. Come go with me. We're going back to Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. 
Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its wall a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Now, last Lord's Day, we came and looked at the importance of community, the importance of community. We started looking at verse number one. Come go back and look at verse one with me again. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand. Now, the text says maintain justice and do what is right. Maintain justice and do what is right. Then we came back and looked at the fact that, that God has revealed to us the history of salvation. We pointed out that at intermittent stages across history, that God stepped in and he intervened in time and in space in order to bring about the community that he always desired there to be. By God doing that, we established the fact that from the very beginning of the Bible, that God wanted human beings to be in existence, and he had three purposes in mind. First of all, to build our lives and to center our lives around God. Secondly, to live in loving community with one another. And then thirdly, to care for the created world. God always wanted us to be concerned about creation. But as we point out almost every week, the Bible tells us that the human race opted not to build its life around God, but rather we as human beings opted to keep control of our own lives. We opted to be in charge of ourselves. We opted to serve ourselves. Then we came back and pointed out that in a world in which everyone is self-absorbed, in a world where everyone is thinking about me and my needs, in a world where everyone is self-centered, the objective of creating community becomes more and more difficult. It actually becomes a lost dream. I told you we don't want pseudo-community. We don't want fake community. We don't want false community. We want to be a people willing to do the work, literally do the work, 
to resolve the conflicts that potentially can exist between us, but it moves us in the direction of authentic community. It moves us to have true community. Finally, we came back and we looked at Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25, where God said, Behold, I will create a new heaven. I will create a new earth. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in my community no more. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat with the ox. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain, saith the Lord. That is all about relationships. Everything in that text directs our attention to the idea of relationship, the future, absolute human community, absolute harmony between us and between the created world. Every relationship, instead of being frayed, instead of being broken, is going to be brought back together again. That's the salvation that is to come. We see that idea further expanded in the New Testament. When we go to the New Testament and we look at the heart of Paul's experience with Christ, Jesus. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now going back and looking at that text again, though the phrase in him is not the obvious focus of this particular passage, the notion of being in Christ lies at the heart of Pauline spirituality. The phrase, in Christ Jesus, occurs more than 50 times in the undisputed Pauline letters, while the phrase is, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in Christ Jesus our Lord, together appear a total of nearly 40 times. Now, some of these texts refer to what God has done in Christ, but the vast majority refer to the existence in Christ, our existence in Christ. And the language is actually spatial language, to live within the sphere of influence. Now, the precise meaning of the phrase varies from context to context, but to be in Christ primarily means to be under the influence of Christ's power, especially the power to be conformed to him and his cross by participation in the life of a community that acknowledges the lordship of Christ Jesus. This communal dimension of Paul's in Christ spirituality is very, very important. Spirituality for Paul is not a private, but a communal reality. Now, this fact is much more evident in the Greek than in the English translations, since nearly all of Paul's pronouns of address are you. They're plural pronouns in the Greek text. Being in Christ refers to the experience not merely of the individual, but for the community into which the person of faith is baptized and in which he and the others coexist together. I want you to look at another text with me. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5. It's a very familiar passage. In your relationship with one another, 
have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, as we will see here shortly, Paul's in Christ language can be used as a reminder that the church does not merely exist in itself as a human community, but as a community in Christ. It could more accurately read, have this mindset in your community, which is indeed a community that is in Christ. To say that Paul's spirituality is not a private matter does not mean, however, that Paul does not have a spiritual personal relationship with God. It does not mean that his spirituality is impersonal. Paul speaks of knowing Christ in a manner that identifies it in a personal way. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now, Paul speaks of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, Philippians 3 and 8. That's personal. That's very personal. He further says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 10, look at that with me. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, notice what the text says. He says that he rejoices in the Lord. He rejoices in the Lord. Now, that's personal. That is very personal. Furthermore, Paul describes his relationship with Christ not only as one of being in Christ, but also of one of Christ being in him. Come go with me to Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse number 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What Paul is talking about here is a very personal relationship this relationship of believers in Christ and Christ in believers is sometimes referred to as a symbiosis or a fusing together. Adolf Deisman offered a very vivid description in the earlier part of the 20th century who compared Paul's Christ intimacy to the air that we breathe. Listen to this quotation. Just as the air of life we breathe is in us and fills us. And yet, at the same time, we live in this air and breathe it. So it is also with the Christ intimacy of the Apostle Paul. Christ in him, he in Christ. Now notice the intimacy here. The Christ in whom believers live also lives in them, both individually as well as corporately. Just as believers have been baptized into Christ's story, so also his story is relived in and among the baptized, among the community of the baptized. This is where the history of salvation has brought us. Do you see the history? What is actually happening here? God comes down into space and into time, and he does it in stages. Each time he comes, he comes more radically with his saving intervention. And every time he comes down, even more radically than before. Therefore, the recipients 
of this grace are more transformed. The community they are a part of is more reconstituted in a more extensive and a more radical way. Now we go back to Isaiah 56 and look at verse number one. What is it really saying there? Look at the verse with me. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. As I shared with you on last week, this is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. Justice and righteousness have to do with relationships. The whole passage is about being a people. It's about being a community. That's the reason why in verse number three, it says this. Come go and look at it with me. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. Now, first of all, I want you to focus on the first part of that verse with me. I want you to notice what it says there. It says, let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. You see, this is talking about community. This is a community living in light of the future, ultimate salvation the final new earth, the final new heaven. We are to be a community that is a foretaste, a sign, a mini version, if you will, of the perfect human community of peace, a mini version of the perfect human community of love, we should be seeking to be a mini version of the perfect humanity of justice that God is ultimately and finally going to reconstitute totally. Now we begin to understand what all these rules are all about. This is not just a set of rules that say, now if you live like this, then God will save you. Think about it. That's not what God is communicating with us. Let me give you an example. When you go to the book of Exodus and we look at the story of God's children that were in Egyptian captivity, in the book of Exodus, where does God give them the law? Where does God provide them with the law? Does he give the people of Israel the law in Egypt? And because they obey the law so perfectly, and because they are so obedient to the law, and because they are so submissive and compliant to the law that he chooses to save them? No, that's not how it is. Absolutely not. He saves them. Then after he saves them, then he provides them with the law. Why? Obviously, you're not saved by obeying the law. You're saved by grace through baptism. Well, then, what's the purpose of the law? To turn you into a community, to turn you into that community that makes you a sign, to turn you into that community that makes you a foretaste of the ultimate community that God will establish. You see, God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you into a community. Walk before me. God then says to the people through Moses, I'm going to make you into this community. Hear this law. Jesus says, because of my cross, because of my death, because of my resurrection, once you embrace me, I make you into a new multi-ethnic people of God, a new human community. And now here is the Sermon of the Mount. What are all these rules about? They're not so much about you as individuals. It's not so much about the ways for you 
to live as individuals. They are mainly about how the community of people who have been transformed by grace should be living together. They're blueprints. Blueprints about our spiritual growth. There are ways for us to be the sign. There are ways for us to be many versions of the future kingdom of God. That's what we're being told here. Now, what are the practical implications of that, Brother Lee? Let me tell you, and I'm going to put it to you as bluntly as I possibly, possibly can. The purpose of God's salvation is to create this new human community. God wants us to be that new human community. You say, well, I thought the purpose of salvation, Brother Lee, was to pardon my sins and to forgive me. Let me help you to understand something this morning. That's a means to an end. Of course, that's incredible, but it's a means to an end. What do you have at the very end of history? You have a city. You have a city that's being constituted by God, a city that's coming from heaven. In other words, God wants a new society. God wants a new community. God wants new human community. Now, let me help you understand exactly what that means. That means this, when God summons you into his salvation, when God summons you into his forgiveness of sins, when God summons you into relationship with him, he also summons you to submit deeply into a new human community, the community of those in your locale who have also been changed by grace. This means you cannot just come show up at the church building even every week and just get information and just get personal inspiration. And apart from that, not ever submit yourself into the community. That's not enough. That's not enough for God, and that's not enough for you. You are frustrating the very purposes of God's saving power. You cannot expect his renovating power to work in your life like that. Yes, he will forgive you of your sins, but the purpose of God's salvation is to change us. How? By putting us into a community. Do not fall from the Western myth that's out here that you can mainly be the product of your own personal individual choices and that therefore by your personal individual decisions and personal individual choices and your personal agenda, you have the power to change yourself. You are mainly the product of how you have been treated. You are mainly the product of your family uh, shaping you and sculpting you through the years. You are much more controlled, and you'll know this the older that you actually get. You are much more controlled by who you have hung with. You are much more controlled by who you have been around across the years. You are much more controlled by the models that you've embraced in your life, and you will never ever be changed into the likeness of God. You will never ever be renovated. You will never ever be transformed by the saving power of God unless you are willing to put yourself into the community, into community that his salvation has been moving toward. You have to do that. So don't come tell me, well, Brother Lee, Brother Lee, uh, I need you to understand that, that I would get involved with Paraland West, but, but you see, I'm transient. Somebody says, well, Brother Lee, I'm only here for just a short project. I'll only be here for just a little while. 
Somebody says, well, Brother Lee, you know, I'm here only for a temporary job or I'm only here, Brother Lee, until I, I complete my degree, until I complete my education. Once I get out of school, once I graduate, I won't be here any longer. It doesn't matter if you are only going to be here in the Houston area for one year. It doesn't matter if you're only going to be in the Houston area for two years. You have to put yourself into a community. And it doesn't mean just show up listening to a sermon and then going home. That's not what it's about. That's not being in a community. That means you've allowed yourself to be in a crowd. It's not the same thing. You need to understand the importance of community. Now, I'm going to stop right here. We're going to come back on next Lord's Day and we're going to continue our study. I'm going to pick up next week the idea, the patterns of human community. What are the patterns of human community? As we continue looking at this theme of sharpening our vision, I pray that you'll join us on next Lord's Day as we continue looking at the subject, building a sense of community. He can move mountains and keeps me in the valley and hide me from the rain. My God, my God is awesome. You know he hears me when I'm broken. He's my strength where I've been awakened forever. Stand to your feet if you can. My God, my God is awesome. He can move
Father, we come once again after having a wonderful worship service. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. And Father, even during troubling times, giving us a way to obey you. Father, we just pray that the words that have been spoken by our minister, the things that have been taught this morning, we can all take these things and apply them in our daily walk. And Father, that the word can become a part of us so that Father, as we live, People that don't know you can understand just what it means to know the truths that come from God just by watching the way we live. Be with us as we go into this this upcoming week. Protect us, dear Lord. Protect those that we love. And Father, just continue to bless the Pearland West Church of Christ, that we can be that beacon of light in a sin-cursed world. Father, that poor souls and sinners can, Father, just ask, what must I do to be saved? And Father, here we are doing your work. Father, allowing you to use us to save those that are lost. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 